Now I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker, which is a tremendous pleasure, because I've known her for a number of years. And she's one of these people who needs no introduction, but she's going to get one anyway. Uh, to get the boring stuff out of the way at the top, uh, Karen is presently what is Assistant Director of Information Technology. Close enough. Close enough? Okay. At uh, Florida State University. <clears throat> and I've known her for so many years, we won't go into how many. Um, but it's a source of frustration to me that she looks so much younger than I do. <laughs> she's also annoyingly personable and fun to be around. And she's a study in contrast. Although she's quite small in stature and hardly seems capable of hurting a fly, due to her service in the, in the U.S. Air Force, she can probably kill you with, your, with her bare hands. <laughs> so be careful of those hallway conversations. Despite her small stature, she has a huge professional footprint. She has managed the PubLive mailing list for many years. She has blogged for going on four years, and many of us have her in a prominent place in our aggregators free-range librarian. She has wrestled with many a curmudgeon on ALA Council and has fought tirelessly to bring ALA into the 19th century. <laughs> it isn't her fault that she's been unsuccessful. She is both sweet and feisty. She will be concerned about your server going down one minute and yet argue with you endlessly about the relative merits of the database applications she has known. She has provided expert testimony in a landmark First Amendment case about free speech on the internet and has been hauled before the judge for using the term metadata too much. I made that last part up. So it's a distinct pleasure to introduce Karen Schneider. Thank you, Roy. The, the check will be in the mail. Okay. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I, I, I hope you can see me over this podium. Um, uh, and uh, Roy brought up my, my military service, and that reminded me of how the other night I had one of those very pleasurable talks that you can only have with other geeks in your particular specialty, which is a, um, an old Air Force friend that tracked me down. Uh, we had both been um, uh, in aircraft maintenance together. I was first an engine mechanic and then an aircraft maintenance officer on fighter aircraft. And we told the kind of jokes that you can only tell in a sub-sub-sub-specialty about why you don't do um, uh, simulated single-engine uh, landings of an F-111, and that's because the other engine invariably goes out, um, which is pretty bad because then the airplane lands and usually not right side up. Um, and it was, it reminded me of what, what a pleasure it must be for you. Um, I'm a fellow traveler, an administrator, a generalist, uh, a uh, hangers-on, a cheerleader of technology, but I'm not truly really a geek in the deepest sense of, of that word. But what a pleasure it must be for you to be among your own kind, as it were, and to be able to share and, and be a little bit unfiltered and, and loosen the girdle and, and just be yourselves without having to like get out the hand puppets and the flannel board and say, okay, and in this part of data, we put the metadata. Here's a table. And I said, table? You know, and, I, and I know, because I'm usually the one saying, oh, so that's a table. Okay, next, you know, um, and, and what, a, what a joy that is for you. So my job here this morning is not to lecture or to hector, um, but I hope to energize and to um, uh, inspire and to give you some, some strategies forward. Um, I think we're all on the same page in, in many ways on, um, on where we need to go as a profession and how important you are, but I want to clarify what that is for me. Just so you have a little more background on me, Roy actually did this for me, but I thought you might want to know <laughs> a little bit more about me you know, these are things that are important to me. And I made this list yesterday, and I studied it for a while, and I realized that what was not on that list were things like love, health, and technology. Um, and that's because those are things that I only think about when they don't work well. Um, and right now, right now, those are, those, there are three things I have pretty much going for me. 
So I have love, health, and technology. I know you guys are having port access problems. I'm, I'm happy with my WebML client, so I'm not. Um, but um, that's, it's interesting how some of the most important stuff to us doesn't end up on a list of what's important simply because it's so seamlessly blended in, sort of like butter in a Bernays sauce. That, that again, we don't notice it until the sauce curdles. Um, a little bit on my reading table. I think most of us are librarians, or we know them, or they're married to them, or we're propagating new ones. Um, <laughs> one of my family, one of, the, one of the reasons I try to be very sensitive to family leave policies is how important it is for us to propagate librarians and developers, and we all need to support that as much as we can. <laughs> Bravo to those of us who will do that. Um, this is an idea of the kind of things that I read, um, and I hope that as, as we proceed through this conference that we share the things that we like to read with one another as well. Um, like you, I'm kind of promiscuous in the area of reading, and uh, um, I will give almost any book or online article a try. I want to talk first about the state of emergency in our profession, and I think most of us feel it, most of us see it, most of us know it. It's something we talk about sotto voce at conferences. It's something we moan about over late night dinners. Uh, two nights ago, I had a, a dinner with Vicki of the Locks Project. Um, and we started out by getting very lost in downtown Atlanta and walking up and down West Peachtree Street three times. And we got very deep into issues like Portico and Google Books and digital preservation. By the time we got to dinner, we were worked up into a total lather about that and global warming. Um, so, <laughs> so it was it was like a pretty pretty thanatopic dinner. Um, we were there talking about several things that that were, were really struck us. One of which is the extent to which how in a very short time we in library land have given away our collections. Um, that's not I don't think that's my phone, is it? Okay, no, that's okay. I understand. I hope mine's muted. Um, <laughs> It's funny how phones aren't smart that way. They're not contextual. They don't move with you and know when to be quiet. Um, like the ultimate toddler. Um, <laughs> we have given away our collections. In a very short period of time, um, huge amounts of our books are being um, digitized by third-party um, companies. Um, like, you know, I mentioned Google. Whose interests do not begin with um, save the time of the reader, or books are for use, whose interests begin with uh, don't be evil. We have also taken all of our journal content, and in some cases, given it over to third-party companies who have pretty much, if you read the fine print, have negotiated away many of our rights. So placing us in an interesting predicament where two-thirds of our content, at least, if not three-quarters or seven-eighths, is in the hand of third-party ownership, which is the first time that's really happened in our profession. And I think most of us know this, know this and most of us talk about it, but we're not entirely sure what to do about, about it. We also don't build or own the tools that manage our collections anymore. It's, it's not the old days when we would buy the shelving and the card catalogs and get out the ink pens and write the cards. Uh, we've, we've seeded that in the 60s and 50s and 70s with the growth of the integrated library system. And that's a disturbing thing. It's something we also talk about, how the integrated library system is owned by them and not by us. So now we've given away our collections and our shelves, and our own uh, in-house systems, and we're not talking about some of the most recent software, but we have a tendency in library land to provide very complex, poorly marketed systems, whether we build them or not. And then a final warning sign that, that I think leads to us being in a state of emergency is that we function like a monopoly service all too often when our competition is thriving right under our nose. And that includes Google Books, Portico, whatnot. Um, and by functioning like a monopoly service, uh, there was a comment on my blog the other day that, that a certain statewide network had 1.6 million users. That makes it sound like every one of those went out and bought the product that they're using. Actually, <coughs> That particular product has one and a half customers, and then, as I like to think of the people who use our library software, 1.6 million hostages. <laughs> <laughs> now they, they may be happy hostages, okay? And that's all right. It's all right to have happy hostages. 
what, and then what you don't want are unhappy hostages. And it's something that AT&T didn't figure out until the breakup of, of, of the phone company, was just what it means like to, to work with a communications monopoly. In fact, many of us, one of the things I'm discovering on campus is that I work with two large monopolies, the tel telecommunications monopoly. I have not been in the academic library for 15 years, and I have to tell you how shell-shocked I am. The technology is the trivial part. Um, is I work with the telecommunications monopoly, which is sort of like AT&T, and then I work with the campus IT monopoly, which is actually a live, friendly, responsive monopoly I enjoy working with. I, I don't mind being a hostage of the campus IT monopoly, because they're good people. And I, I will always be a, a happy servant of a, of a, of a benign and benevolent uh, ma matriarch or matriarchy. Um, but it's the telco monopoly that we are constantly scheming against. And it's like the first option we have to break away from the monopoly that wants to charge us $70,000 to upgrade the Wi-Fi in one small building, I will. And remember that about your 1.6 million users, that they are only hostage as long as it's a monopoly. And they can be, if they're happy hostages, they'll stay with you. If they're not happy, they'll go, go elsewhere. And I think a lot of you know that already. I want to go back to the idea of the state of emergency. And this is a quote from Andrew Abbott from a great book called The System of Professions. Andrew is the one who wrote about how the, um, the, the train system in the United States didn't understand what business it was in. That the train system in the United States thought it was in the train business. And, the train, and that's why Amtrak is as bad as it is today. What they did not understand is that they were in the transportation business. And he, drive, and he wrote many parallels in that book, including the information industry. And most of us have said, we are not in the paper book business, we're in the information business. In fact, I would even go a little bit farther than that. But before I get to that, I want to talk a bit about the heartland of work. I really do think that what you're doing now is the heartland of work. I think that the work with digital libraries and digital collections and library-owned software brings us back to something very classic and pure and important. And, and um, it is, in fact, it is getting us back to memory work. You know, get beyond gaming in libraries and Dance Dance Revolution and, and you know, the latest virtual reference chat, whatnot. One of the primary things that we do in society, and we do it so well and we do it with such heart, is we do memory work. Is that we pre preserve and provide access to our culture's memories, whether they are in print or virtual or spoken word or video or many, many new things that we haven't even imagined, is that this is our work. And it's not only our work, but it is our passion and it is something for which we have fallen on the sword for again and again and again, such as Zoya Horn did in the early 1970s when she refused to release patron information over to investigators who went to jail for 30 days rather than betray her own patrons. That's the kind of selflessness that we have in our profession for what we do. And it's the memory work, and nobody else cares about memory work. If you look at Google's um, front page, and understand, I don't hate Google, I use Google every five minutes, I just have a very complicated relationship with Google, a uh, complicated and concerned relationship with Google. But they don't start out by saying, we're in the business of making sure that people have access to um, the memory work of, of their culture. Their, their first phrase is, don't be evil. In fact, it's not even, do be good. <laughs> Whereas we pretty much start out in our profession with a number of documents that talk about how our mandate is to be good and to do good. And if you look at um, things like Ranganathan's Five Laws, how it starts out with books are for use. Is that not such a class classic and even radical statement about the nature of our profession? This is what we are. We are memory work. I'm going to briefly bring up a strategy that I think is important. This is something that I apply a lot in my own work, which is the 531 rule. And I, I briefed this, I brought this up uh, last fall when I was in South Africa talking to the Special Libraries Association there about how to implement social software technology in libraries. And I said, there's so much out there, how do you decide? First, you pick five issues you believe are really important. Then you focus on three, and now you make that one happen. And now, it's like juggling. At any one time, you may actually have three balls in the air. It can be, I'm working on my institutional repository, I'm working on Evergreen, 
I'm working on restarting the server. Okay, maybe restarting the server is a little higher up right now. But um, the idea is that, that in an in a era where we are constantly in a state of continuous partial attention, try to carve out time at any one time for something where you are really giving that one thing your excellence. So here are five things we can fix. And of course, there's many, many more. Um, I was watching, you know, last night someone mentioned global warming, and I got up this morning and saw houses sliding down the hill in San Francisco and thinking, called home to say, aren't you glad we sold our condo and moved to Florida <laughs> so that a hurricane could hit us? Um, <laughs> five things we can fix include digital preservation, standards adoption, the sucky state of most library software, third party library content hegemony, and scholarly awareness of key issues in library land. I think everybody in this room would agree that these five issues are important and probably have 15 more that they would say are important. Now, let's just say that we can take standards adoption and a couple other issues and fold them into these three. Digital preservation, which is also a scholarly awareness issue. Uh, about a month ago, I was at ALA at a luncheon with other people who write for a publication and our editor asked us, well, gee, what kind of topics can we come up with next year for these interesting books and articles? And somebody mentioned some kind of fun, funky social software, and somebody mentioned something else. And I said, digital preservation. And the room fell silent. I mean, it was like, it was the blank, cold, stony stare. They immediately went into Mego mode. You know, my eyes glaze over. They're going like, okay, I am so bored already, and I don't even know what this is, you know? So I said, okay, so then I thought for a second and I said, how about I do a article on digital disaster preparedness? And everybody said, yay! And as I said to Vicki from the Locks Project, I, I was nice enough not even to make the point that I had just said the same thing, only differently. Um, okay, so the second thing we could also focus on is the sucky state of most library catalog software, which is a big deal. Um, and the third thing we could focus on is a scholarly awareness of key issues in library land, which are again are related to the previous two. So now let's just look at one. The sucky state of most library software. You know what this is? Okay, you're probably thinking, this is where they hide the metadata. No, um, <laughs> this is actually um, an outpost on the Maginot line, which was kind of one of those technical um, errors of um, the 20th century. And, um, we certainly, we have a lot of Maginot lines in library land, and uh, most library software is part of it. Um, it relates very poorly to the, kind, to, to the type of memory work we're actually doing right now, so that all the, all the really good content flows around and behind it, and, into, um, and occupies poor defenseless France. Um, here's four nifty happenings with library software that can make our day. There's Evergreen, which I'm going to be talking about in more detail, which is absolutely marvelous. Marvelous, 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 and I'll explain why. There's Ross Singer's Umlaut, which is also yummy, delicious, fabuloso, okay? Um, this is the kind of thing we need to be doing, seizing control of the tools we, we know we need to have and that we can create ourselves. We can create these ourselves. Scriblio, from um, our friend Casey, but Casey Bisson, who um, did this wonderful software based on WordPress, it can actually give a small library an entire interface to the web and its catalog and everything else in a very simple fashion. And then finally, um, and of course there's many more examples, the solar search engine, you're all going to go home to bolt on top of your ge geezy old ILS middleware, right? You know, we're gonna all, all print up our, uh, give our, give our pigs a, a little silk dress or two. So those are, those are four really wonderful things. Just four of them. Just four. Four that came off the top of my head. Um, and here's the great thing about this. We're really in a renaissance of librarian-built software. For the first time, it's like we're shaking ourselves awake and really grabbing hold, really seizing the day. What does this do for us, librarian-built software? First of all, it begins to restore the, restore the balance of um, power in our profession. At least you're getting the shelving back. Okay, at least you're getting the shelving back. It reinstates the direction of our profession. You know, whose, whose memory work is this anyway? It is our memory work. This is what we do, all right? This is what we do. It puts the emphasis back on the library's memory organization. Instead of all these third party companies see, that we're ceding to, and it sends the message that we mean business and furthermore that we're capable of delivering this business. 
It's not that we can't do it or we don't want to do it or we think our needs are better served by third party vendors. This is truly our business. And, uh, boy, I hate to ask this, but I've got a little uh, memory loss here myself. Um, how long do I have to go to? Until 10 15. Um, and it's really important that we, that, we, that we send that message soon and quickly and clearly that we mean business. Soon and clearly. There's some wonderful other outcomes that come with librarian-built software. And I know you know all these things, but I want to make the point that you have been delivering this message to people like me. One of, one of the things that I find exciting is the creative decoupling of components. Um, instead of these monolithic packages that, are, that um, we have to buy into where everything is pried into one not so comfortable overall of library software, uh, we can mix and match our separates, you know. We no longer have, uh, we had, you know, first of all, putting a, uh, a different search engine on top of an ILS to prove that we could and, and that it was better. We see different modules ar arising um, and being mixed and remixed in different ways. We have interesting reuse of other tools, such as WordPress. Um, Casey has done tremendous work with WordPress and, and library software, and I think it's fascinating. In fact, I know of another WordPress plugin being produced by the Institute for the Future of the Book that allows for paragraph by paragraph analysis. And I, I was scheming with Vicki as we were lost in Atlanta the other night and trying to find our way. We, we actually determined it was like the, one of the most productive talks we'd ever had where we're like buttonholing policemen and so forth. Where are we? You know, <laughs> and then we would get back to talking about the state of librarianship. Um, and um, I want to take like different legal agreements that we librarians sign into routinely and put them in this WordPress plugin and have people comment paragraph by paragraph on them and really get into some conversations in the profession. You like that? It's cool, huh? Yeah, go for it. Party co. I'm in there. Um, <laughs> and the resocialization of librarian artisans. We used to be kind of an artisan profession. We didn't build the books, but we designed the systems that manage the memory collections, okay? We designed the systems that manage the memory collections. So, so we've now got this wonderful renaissance of the artisan librarian who builds, who builds the tools that manages the collections. Um, and, and there's enough of them, you're getting enough critical mass that you're able to socialize. And we have this wonderful thing called the internet, the same thing that allowed me and my old pal from, from uh, my station in, in Korea to, to giggle about um, maintenance on fighter aircraft. The same thing allows you to be a wonderful community of, of, uh, of, of, of communicants. And I, and I have to, you know, it's funny, it might be just trite to point out the internet is useful. But you know, it's really kind of remarkable, isn't it? Um, how quickly and how easily we can, we can, we can have these small pieces loosely joined. Um, my big one today is Evergreen. And I have to point out to you that from my point of view as a librarian administrator, um, who spends a lot of time looking at money and thinking about outcomes and thinking around the corner, Evergreen is huge. It is really, really huge. The timing is absolutely perfect. We are in an era of worrisome consolidation. Now, one of the things you have going against Evergreen is that we also have extreme market saturation. It's like nobody, nobody who can meet, who really is able of bringing up a catalog doesn't have one. Um, so everybody, pretty much at this point, you're, you're simply moving um, checkers around on a board. But on the other hand, it's very worrisome consolidation that, you know, I know that I'm going to go stand in for our interim director at the ACERL meeting um, this spring. This is the Association of South Eastern, Eastern Regional Librarians. It's one of these dangerous places where your directors get ideas. Um, <laughs> and, and my job there is, as a mole is to go in there and keep saying things like evergreen and mm, worrisome market consolidation. <laughs> I really believe if you say things on often enough, they begin to have the weight of truth. And, it's and you need to remember that as well. But it is, uh, as paradoxically, here's the other great thing, is the centrality of the ILS is weakening. One of the interesting phenomena we discussed a couple of weeks ago with our ILL statistics was, 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 was the nature of our ILL cancellation rate. We actually have a very high satisfaction rate at FSU with our ILS. But the cancellations, a lot of the time, have to do with what? Anybody? 
How are they, how, why are they canceling? You're all like, I don't work with ILL. <laughs> Somebody bail me out here. Okay. It's because the thing's really in your library? Yes, and in what format? Uh, online. Yes, exactly. Exactly. We're getting a very high cancellation rate of, of delivering content online, which paradoxically means, a more, means that cancellation is satisfaction. Isn't that interesting? And cancellation used to mean, I hate you, you can't get me the book. You know, <laughs> cancellation means, wow, you found it for me. Um, and that's a very interesting, one of the many, many little, little dot leaders that you need to watch in terms of trends. Um, this, how many people know that their students are, like, going to use the catalog as an absolute last resort? Okay, honestly, let's be honest, your, your, your users are not going to the catalog first for information. You know that, right? All right. Somewhere, somewhere down there with asking their mother, you know? Uh, <laughs> And it's actually probably easier to ask your mother, um, in many cases, I'm afraid to say, um, and possibly more accurate. Um, but the centrality of the ILS is weakening, and that's a good thing. Why? Because it means there's less risk involved with something like an ILS migration. It's not everything it used to be anymore. It's not as important as it used to be, and that means that the willingness to take risks with software is going to be much higher and will continue to grow. Um, that's, that's a non-trivial factor, sort of part of the game theory of how you can sell a product. You know, it, the more important that pacemaker is, you know, would you like this new cheaper pacemaker, it's open source? I don't think so. <laughs> um, or at least tell me, sell me, sell it to me a little differently, you know. On the other hand, would you like this new cheap coffee grinder? It's open source. Okay, so, you know, one morning my coffee's not as good as it can be. Maybe it'll be a little better the next day after they, you know, come out with Coffee Maker 1.02. <laughs> I do read release notes. Um, but I want to bring up some useful overgeneralizations that I need to make you aware of, okay. Nobody... Nobody cares about open source. Now, I know you care about open source, but nobody cares about open source, all right? Outside this room, honestly, it's overgeneralization, but as soon as you say open source, it's like when I said digital preservation, bang, you know, the door slams, and now I've got to fight my way back in, all right? Nobody cares about standards. I find that appalling, but it's absolutely true, and it seems to be more true with the millennial with, I would say, the less technical millennial librarians of all people. You can sort of get the older, you know, crunchy, metadata-loving, you know, free speech believing the librarian to go, standards, I get it, NISO, right. Or the other day at, at our associate director's meeting, I, I, I know I'm telling tales out of school, but there was like massive confusion among the other ADs about NACO versus NISO, which if you've done cataloger work, is pretty funny. But anyway, I'm like trying to explain the difference between cataloging authorities and, and, and international standards, and it's like, I'm just like, take me now, Lord. Um, <laughs> But nobody cares about standards, and unfortunately, and this is worrisome, I have found, really, again, as I mentioned, a trend of young, the younger, less technical millennials, and even some of the more technical, who say, oh, standards, you know, they're not really, I, I, don't, I don't make them essential to my life. Nobody cares about usability, and I know you care about usability, and I care about usability, but you'd be surprised how many, how many librarians still care about it, how it works for them, and, 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 and I'm going to give you some tips for how to deal with that. And nobody cares about Evergreen. And I only say that to slightly tweak you, but, to, but again, to get back to the comment that was made on my blog about, we have 1.6 million users. No, you don't. You have one and a half customers and 1.6 million hostages. Nobody cares about Evergreen. They want to read books. They want to check them out. They want to renew a hold. Those are things that, they, that we can make them care passionately about. We don't really want them to care about Evergreen, honestly. We really don't. Hopefully, they were not even going to be thinking that they're using Evergreen. They're going to be thinking that they've been delivered this absolutely marvelous experience, and it was brought to them by their library. Okay? That's what they want. They don't care about software, period. Um, here's some more useful generalizations. The ARL body count, or how many books you have on the shelf, still continues to drive far too many decisions. Be aware of that. When you think strategically, be aware that 
I know it's just, I mean, I was kind of shocked coming into academic libraries. I thought, well, surely they are delivered by these very abstract, digitally oriented key indicators that have to do with excellence. And what is the first thing I heard? How many books do we have on the shelf? I'm like, your users are not there. Do you see your statistics, circulation statistics? Do you see where most of the attention and focus is? Do you see all this digital content we spent a bazillion dollars on and are now struggling to provide access to? But, and yet the number one indicator is books on the shelf. I mean, how embarrassing is that? But it's a factor and we have to deal with it. And I mean, I'm a book lover, I write books, I write in traditional forms as well as non-traditional forms, but I mean, honestly, how, to, how embarrassing is that? IT directors do not have the resources to take on unfunded mandates. That's another thing you need to keep in your mind when you work with, um, when you are trying to sell a product or an idea. They just don't. Um, they want to, in their heart of hearts, they are on board with you. And I know in some cases they are you, or they supervise you when you work with them. But just keep in mind that generally we're trying to do way too much as it is, you know, with someone bopping into the office every day asking for some other, you know, thing that you're trying to beat back with a stick so that you can develop the IR or develop the, the catalog interface. And most libraries, and I, I'm simply talking in terms of gross statistics across all types of libraries, cannot provide developer time. Now, I say that, but I, there are some libraries that can do this better than others, and that includes uh, those in higher education. Um, and that's something to keep in mind. And one of the things to keep in mind there is when you, as a community, tend to be dominated by a particular voice, keep in mind that you have a responsibility to the voices who aren't heard. Um, it's very important that the libraries that can't provide developer time and aren't necessarily at the table be represented in, in how you design software. You have that responsibility as librarians. Remember, you decided to take on memory work. You now have a much wider responsibility than the needs of your own institution. How do directors see the world? Now, I've been a rural library director, I've been an assistant director for technology a couple of places, so I get around directors a lot. And I actually love good library administrators, and I work for one right now. He's been, he's, he's, well, he's been around for a long time, Dr. Summers. And he has some very, he has some wonderful, wonderful things to say, and he's very astute about technology. Um, in fact, one time I finished uh, my technology plan, and, he, and my, the critique was that I hadn't gone into shibboleth enough. So, you know, I said, oh, okay, you know, put up the graph, a little more about shibboleth. Um, but directors see the world through several prisms. How much does it cost, and what are we getting for the money? I mean, quite honestly, from a user's point of view, how can you quibble with that question? What are other directors doing? You know, that's not a lemming-like question. That's actually fairly intelligent. Although, again, there's this danger thing as they all go to ARL and come back wanting a learning commons, you know? I mean, you've been there, right? I mean, it's, it's, just, it's contagious. If we could just, for one year, keep them away from conferences so that, you know, we could just continue in the work that we're doing and not have to take on new things. Um, but we should try that some year. Um, what problems will it create? This is something that we tend to, coming from more of the IT side of things, we don't always see the problems that new, develops, new, new developments will bring to the table. Then there's the pragmatic question, which is related to the first one, but still different. Why would I spend time and money on this rather than something else? In a land of competing interests, why is this the most important thing to do? These are questions that you have to answer ahead of time. You have to know exactly what the answer is. And if you say that it's because it's open source, I am going to take a stick and beat you over the head. Um, and then the, the sort of Dr. Summers question, he wouldn't put it this way, although he would laugh and agree with me. Is this thing fully baked? I mean, am I dealing with something real? Or is this kind of some vaporware project that you're now signing me on to that's going to suck me bone dry and annoy the other associate directors, OK? These are practical, pragmatic questions that when you're up there competing toe to toe with other resources and attentions and, and other, other negotiators, you've got to be able to answer these questions. Also, this is really sad. And again, do I understand why open source is important? Absolutely. But I, I have spoken with several directors recently and asked them what they know about open source. Generally, open source is software that's written by one guy in a garage 
probably a torn and dirty t-shirt. Um, and then furthermore, as I was informed, um, it's one, the open source software is one car accident away from orphan software. Now actually, there is quite a lot of open source software that is written by one guy in a garage. And I have actually worked with software developed by such a person. And I would frequently say to my advisory board, it's not just the fact that, that you're one car accident away from losing the developer, but I will probably be driving the car, so that's two people you're going to be losing. <laughs> um, that first of all, they know, and remember, this is what they know. They know that there's no support model for open software. I've been told this too. I asked them, what's the problem with open source software? Well, there's no support model for it. You just have to fix it yourself, and we don't have time to do that. That's what vendors do for us. So that's why, yeah, I know. You, you can laugh too. I mean, just, I mean, I, I am so there with you. But um, it also, open source software has a cheesy make-do quality. And, and again, we have to look at ourselves sometimes. I mean, the times that I've, I've said about a piece of software, why can't it do X? Well, you know, you know, beggars can't be choosers. It's free. It's open source. You know, um, Audacity, SoundForge. Okay, you know, I use Audacity at home because it's free. I use SoundForge at work because we bought it and it's wonderful. You know, I mean, there's just no no competition. It's arcane and developer oriented. I've been told. Um, and that's, of course, not at all true with all software. Actually, Audacity is a very easy product to use, for example, to take a nice little product out there. Um, but there is, as with most stereotypes, there is sometimes an element of the truth. And one of the things I would caution you about in how you present yourself to others, how you present your software, and how you design it, is, is not to do the classic librarian mistake of designing things for yourself. Don't design things for developers. They are not, design things for your hostages, okay? For your, for your 1.6 million users who are trying to renew a book. Um, and um, yes, you have to also consider the, the middle people and the, the librarians, but, but keep that in mind as, as a design principle. Also, the other thing they know about open source, and this is the typical chicken and egg problem, is nobody else is doing it. Um, and that's something you have to counter. And of course, you can you can then bring up the big models. But every, almost everybody uses Apache. You know, um, look how good that is. Um, what a, it's a terrific example, actually, because it's it's an example where you know the good product is the one that costs less money. Um, and in fact, at the top technology trends at, at ALA Midwinter, I found myself probably the first time in my profession disagreeing with Clifford Lynch, because Here's the thing about directors and money and budgets. If you can do the same thing for less money, that's what you want to do. Because the money you have left over goes for other things that you want to do. I mean, it's a very simple economic fact. But if you can go, to, if you can use Apache for free and it's better, or even as good as, that's a win, right? And that's the same thing with concepts such as evergreen. And that was the point I was making at Top Technology Trends. If you can do the same thing for less money, and I'm talking significantly less money, why would you not do that? In fact, you almost have a moral obligation to do it. I would say in some places you might end up having a legal obligation to do it. Um, can you say bidding wars? Um, So, having brought all that up, I want to talk a little bit. I'm going to, one of the things, other things up my sleeve is I have an MFA in writing, which means that I walk around with a red pen and mark things up a lot, um, often my own writing. But um, I, I, I looked at openils.org for a while this week, and I also shared it with friends, uh, people who are in IT themselves, people who are collection development librarians, people who are directors, and openils.org open is the website for Evergreen, essentially. Um, and I asked them to read this and tell me what they what what was missing, or what they what they understood, and what questions they felt should be here. Um, they, there's eight questions on openils.org, and the first one is, "What is open source software?" Now, what did I just tell you? <laughs> okay, you know what? The first question should be, "Why should you use this product?" Okay. And then the next question should be something like, 
Why is Evergreen better than any other integrated library system software on the market? Third, why must you build Evergreen into your migration plans? I mean, first of all, these aren't frequently asked questions. These are questions you are thinking people would frequently ask from your developer's mindset. They're, so you might as well go out there and find out what the, what, but you need to both make up some questions and solicit some. So the questions need to be in the order of what modules have been developed and what new modules will be coming out, all right? Because that was a question I got consistently. I mean, I had to go dig and dig and dig through another page to find out what modules you had available. This is a very basic marketing question. Sell me your product, all right? Um, how will Pines member libraries and other Georgia libraries and the general library community have input in the development process? That's not a bad question, although I didn't like the way it was answered. I want to help? No, no. No, you don't want to help. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's very good use of PowerPoint. <laughs> One word. Um, but um, you don't want to help. You want to use the product. How can you sell me on Evergreen would be a great pitch to make. All right? Um, and uh, what are some of your future milestones? Start to think like vendors. And if you can't think like vendors, get help from people who do think like vendors. Because we are here to help. Um, several flags. The software can be downloaded for free and anyone can contribute to development efforts. Now that would scare most directors <coughs> right out the door, okay? Uh, opening an FAQ with an explanation of open source software. No special information for potential users who are not developers and no discernible timeline. Big flags, okay? Also, let's be very careful. <laughs> I, I, I have brought this up repeatedly, but we need to be really careful about the use of the word free. And I say that as somebody who very carefully husbands her, her human resources. There's free beer and there's free kittens. All right, you've probably heard this from me before in other venues. Free beer is great, you drink it, it goes through you, mazel tov. Free kittens, incur a huge responsibility for up to 20 years or longer, and they require maintenance and education and commitment of time and resources, okay? There's no such thing as free software, unless you're like downloading Audacity at home and you can go in and use source ports the next day. There is no such thing as free software. Yes, there is. <laughs> There's no such thing as free software. Um, unless you have slave labor. And I do not have slave labor. Is that um, the next word you're using up there? Or is it Firefox? That's Firefox. Is that okay? Do you use well, Firefox? I like free software or not. <laughs> <laughs> When's the last time you had to read the pilot? <laughs> well, I, do you want me to get into Firefox versus Explorer, or can I finish my talk? <laughs> That's another blog post. The errors Firefox has made. Let's buy the t-shirt. You know, they, Firefox could have a much bigger market share if it peddled itself a little better and didn't try to sell itself as the geeky alternative. That's just my take. Um, and there is a cost to Firefox, but that's, I love it, I use it, but, okay. Equinox, this is a company, uh, I believe, that is intended to maintain Evergreen, which is the future of library automation, I think, which has to do with the card catalog, as I can tell. <laughs> and, um, it's, and it signals the end of the world as we know it, because the blurb tells me so. Okay, here we go again with frequently asked questions. And this is where I get into kind of a, a manic loop. What is Evergreen? It's an open source integrated library system. Stop already. Stop telling me it's open source. Start telling me what it does for the user, okay? Um, and, and onward and upward. How not to sell Evergreen? <coughs> Start by saying it's open source, use the word cool, talk about benefits to the profession at large, express your interest in hiring lots of coders to help build Evergreen, uh, all of which will scare your director, and hold back facts that will become evident as soon as the director phones a call. Okay? You know, E.B. White said, if you don't know how to pronounce a word, say it loud. And do the same thing. We don't have the acquisitions module. It's in development. But you can still try Evergreen today. And remember things like that. Five strategies, the riveting lead. Uh, it was a bright cold day in April and the clock was striking 13. In that first sentence, you have to be able to grab the reader. 
The elevator talk, can you describe Evergreen in two minutes that will make a sale? Researching your background, uh, getting people like me well versed in what the product's about, and speed dial for key stakeholders, uh, which means that you always have a, a close tab um, people who are who believe in you and can be the, the avatars for your your stuff. Okay, I was going to get into biblio creature feed, which is um, the uh, disturbing tendency of last generation librarians to love complex systems they have to teach people to use, and how they become a little smarter in the lingo and and will push back with you about our users need this. They'll try to speak about it from a user centric process. We're into this thing now with browse headings in our new catalog where people are saying, we have to be able to browse headings. We can't move to Endeka because browse headings is so important. And I, would, and I would like to tell you from any of the search logs that I've seen, there's no indication that any user is out there actually doing that. And that's understandable because it's not useful. Um, <laughs> and you know the cure. Um, Search log analyses, be sure that you build in tools like these so that you can easily determine what your users are doing. Even my trio is bugging me now. Okay, I'm wrapping up. Ethnographic studies, um, heuristic evaluations, usability testing, convincing people to do all of the above. Um, I would say that Lou Rosenfeld and Rich Wiggins are working on a great book called Search Analytics for Your Site. I hope you get it. Um, very useful. These, these are part of your toolkit for pushing back. Pushing back at the big walls between you and your 1.6 million hostages you're trying so hard to serve, okay? I also think, I was thinking about this early this morning, you know, once upon a time we didn't have interlibrary loan and now every library has an ILO librarian. Um, once upon a time we didn't have catalogers and then we had those. I really think that every library needs a developer. And I think it's a message that we need to start selling. And if we had, if every library had to have a developer dedicated to some part of it, obviously more developers would be better, but if, you had, if it was just routine, if it was part of our landscape that we always had a developer, think of how much work we'd be able to do. If that was just understood, that it was not an extra or, or a add-on. And also, every developer needs a library. The rest of us are your avatars. We represent you to people who hold huge pots of money. We represent you often to the 1.6 million hostages you're trying to serve. Many times your instincts are right on, but you need other people to represent what you're doing. Um, I think we keep you real. Recap, really, it is here in this room where the future of the profession lies. It is right here among us, okay? What you do tomorrow is the leads to the how our culture proceeds in the future. It has to do with every last little bit of memory work that we do in society. Okay, you are that important. You are really the future of libraries. You really are libraries. I really appreciate uh, this chance to come speak with you and um, I've got to go write a, a letter in support of a grant for some of that free software. Um, but um, I'd be happy to go toe to toe with you on Firefox afterwards as you please. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, I, I get yelled at every day. Um, uh, I, I'm going to tell you that, that most of this talk was oriented towards how important 
it is to be creating open source software. All right? But there is a trope out there that it's free software. And I'm sorry, I have heard it so many times, it makes me physically ill. And I know you mean freedom and not free, okay? I know you mean that. But then it is up to you, either yourselves or through other people, to reorient that message, okay? And not just leave it up to a few of us out there with our, our bats and balls um, to do it. Um, and it's, it's a crucial message, but it's a message that is very mangled in the telling. Okay, that's, that's my take. As it, more as a writer than anything else. Great. And Karen, you're going to be around for a while, right? Yes, but I'm going to need my laptop yeah. back because I really have to spray no, that we will. <laughs>